Hello, and welcome to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. If you're watching the video, we're happy to have you join us. I'm Steve Green, your host. If you're listening to the audio, well, you already heard me in the intro. So welcome back, and we're glad to have you with us. My guest today, there's been a slight change. We were supposed to have Chief John Vance with us from B Shifter, but he had some uh, issues that ar arose just this morning, so he's not going to be able to make it. But with us today um are two of his cohorts uh with b shifter and uh nick brunacini he joined the fire phoenix fire department in 1980 as a firefighter he retired in 2009 as a shift commander 2010 to 2019 he was the blue card instructor and publisher of b shifter magazine 2019 to present he manages the allen v brunacini command training center and b shifter.com websites also with us today is Josh Blum. Uh, Josh began working in the fire service in 1990 as a volunteer. I'm gl so glad you used the word working as a volunteer because volunteers do work in the fire service. And some people say, well, they're just volunteers. They don't do anything. Yeah, we do. We do plenty of it. And he has worked his way up through the ranks to deputy fire chief. He spent his entire career working in Hamilton County, Ohio, which we both found out that I lived right around the corner at a uh, point uh, way back when in the 70s. Uh, through a large majority of his career, uh, Josh served in several different positions on OHTF-1. He began working with Blue Card in 2008, and he, he is now the operations manager for Blue Card, striving to do better tomorrow than today. Great, great phrase to end that bio with. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for making time. I know we've jumped on dates and times and stuff like that to try to make this happen. And then Chief Vance decides he has to go to City Hall for something. Uh, amazing. Right? Okay. So, Josh, we're going to start with you. Let's talk a little bit about Blue Card and B-Shifter. What, what's it all about, please? Yeah, so um, Blue Card is actually really the the learning system and certification that's connected to the fire command book. So um, Chief Bernasini started writing that and Nick jump in here, please with the, the date, the date line, but uh, er, early sixties, maybe uh, some notes on what, what fire command really is. Um, and then, you know, fire command one comes out, uh, fire command two comes out and um, the, the books really are, kind of like an SOP and everybody can read that and interpret that a little bit different. Um, and the basis of, of what's written in the book really hasn't ever changed. Um, Blue card is just the learning system to teach the second edition of fire command. And, and, and soon we're going to have the third edition of fire command. It lines up much better with uh, the actual blue card system and what's going on, you know, today in our industry. Right. Right. And, uh, we want to make sure that our listeners and viewers know that, you know, this is not just about this podcast. It's not just about the B-Shifter podcast, which you should be listening to uh, each week. If you're, uh, whether you're an active firefighter, whether you're career, volunteer, part pay, WUI, it doesn't make any difference. You should be listening to the B-Shifter uh, podcast because it, basically the podcast doesn't just shoot the bull like we you know a lot of podcasts do to talk about fire service and a bunch of guys sitting around but every podcast that b shifter puts out is a lesson you're going to learn something from it it's not formalized like classroom it's just a couple of people sitting around talking about issues that are important basically to the health and safety of every firefighter especially when you're on the fire ground and a lot of people say, well, I've already learned it and I learned that. And I, you know what? If you're not, and we've said this before, if you're not open to being educated, to continue to be educated as a firefighter, as you go through your career, then maybe this career isn't for you because there is no end in learning to be a firefighter. I've seen the changes in, from my 40 years ago to what we have today. Could we have used some of today's stuff back then? Oh, yeah. Like, I like radios. You guys all have radios today. There were two radios back in my day, one built into the truck and one for the officer. The rest of us, we had to listen for the air horns. 
we need to get the hell out of Dodge when those air horns went out. And that was it. Today, look what you have. There's so much available to you if you're open to learn. All right. So one of the things that we talk, that we talked about just before we went on the air that has really been uh, made an impression on me, and as I mentioned, that it's also been very important to this podcast because we're very concerned with the often lack of 360 size ups. The the uh, we're also very concerned with May days. The number of May days are growing. Uh, you know, we we want to have Chief Abbott. Uh, when Chief Vance and I planned this, we were hoping to be able to have Chief Abbott join us because of all his amazing work on it. But he was going through some personal issues, and we didn't want to intrude um, on those. But still, uh, we've done uh, several podcasts about the concept of May Days. We did a webinar about, do you as a firefighter know what your job is or what to do when there's a May Day sounded on your fire ground, but you're not involved in the May Day? Do you know what to do? And we did. We had a great w- webinar on that. So let's talk about what some of the stuff that I've heard on B Shifter on the May Day episodes. I think you guys really help with what you offer in Blue Card to help chief officers, the ICs, no matter their rank, whoever the IC is, help them with the organization of their duty and that fire ground. Let's. Can we talk about uh, how? blue card works on on those circumstances sure kind of to pick up where josh left off is fire command uh my dad started developing that in the late 60s early 70s and that was really i think the the reason he did that is because it, the incident scene, he kept experiencing personally and with all the other uh, firefighters he worked with, uh, the consequences of kind of the way they operated then. And so fire command really was started as a, as a, as a way to organize the fire ground so you could make sense out of it and uh, be more effective in the work we did and also safer. So that was the nexus to create the system in the first place. And if you look at the evolution of it, is after fire command was developed, the next thing that happened is the 1500 standard was created by the NFPA for firefighter health and safety. Well, it's interesting that that's where the incident command standard ended up, is in the firefighter health and fitness and safety standard. So <clears throat> this has been like the original work of the fire command system since its creation was to reduce the uh, risk to firefighters operating at the scene of structure fires. And my career, <clears throat> I started in 80, uh, the, in 2001, the, the only firefighter line of duty death from structural firefighting happened during my damn near 30 year career with the Southwest supermarket right. fire. And what we did with that is it was a forensic analysis that took at least a couple years to figure out exactly all the uh, contributing factors that led to Brett Tarver dying that day in that uh, fire. So we took all of that at the time, and that was probably, that was the early 2000s. Once we kind of figured out what happened, and we thought it was a failure of the rapid intervention system at the time. Is, is be, we needed to move him 65 to 70 feet, and it took over 20 minutes to do that. Well, there was a variety of reasons that happened. So all of that got cooked up into this, this basically five-year recovery process that happened at the end of my father's career as the fire chief in Phoenix, Arizona. So literally, there were hundreds of thousands of hours spent uh, dissecting that incident and then coming up with solutions for it. Well, that's really what the blue card system is today. And and people, see, the thought is, is we can be out of control with the regular incident operation, and we're going to have a controlled piece for the firefighter mayday, should that happen. And it's its own little organization. Well, that doesn't work. That's bullshit, just to use a word. Once that flywheel blows up, there's no fixing it. So what Fire Command represents is all the stuff you got to be doing ahead of that May Day. <clears throat> when the May Day happens, is you were organized enough now that you can take some corrective steps to 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 fix that. 
So that's really kind of what the blue card system is. And, and, and that's the, the beauty of it is people, see, firefighters see it today and think, oh, I love this part and this part and this part. Well, the whole thing is a vessel so the incident commander can manage whatever's going on in that hazard zone to control the position and function of the firefighters operating at the scene. So, and, and like I say, that started in, I don't know, the mid 60s, the work to put that system together and it has continued in a straight line today. So, and, and I think that's why Blue Card has uh, seeing the growth it's seeing is people are starting to recognize that. Well, if you look at NFPA standards, the 1500 and 1700 standards, all were born out of this effort to manage an IDLH hazard zone and all the, the, the different pieces that, that present challenges to us in that. So I'm going to ask you to do one small thing, which is because we have some, we know we have listeners in some areas that um, uh, kind of rural and uh, mostly small volunteer companies. Would you define for them what IDLH means? Just so they'll, they'll be aware of it. Immediately dangerous to life and health. So, and that is an OSHA term. So that's kind of how we describe what a structure fire is for us. So, and we're uniquely qualified and equipped to deal in those type of hazard zones. It's, it, it usually connects to uh, the firefighter PPE package with the SCBA. So if you look at a firefighter today, they are completely ensconced in what looks like an entry suit today, is there's no, they're not exposed in any way against the fire. So we take our own atmosphere in and breathe with us. That is the difference. Is it, <clears throat> see Steve, early on with the development of the system, is it competed with NIMS back in the day? And you're like, oh, I'm doing fire commander NIMS. Well, that's inaccurate because both systems complement each other. NIMS was not created for SCBA work. NIMS was created for defensive fire operations, basically in the wildland setting with airplanes and everything else, right. and long duration, big, heavy incident operations. Blue Card Fire Command was developed for structure fires, basically short, intense periods in a hazard zone where you're tied to finite air supplies that last uh, basically 15 minutes. So those are the constraints we operate with. Well, for a long time, the fire service didn't recognize that because we could do everything at the scene of a structure fire ahead of putting the fire out. We could search the building. We could open the, the concealed spaces. We could ventilate. We could do all these things before we did fire control. That's not true today. If you use that same approach, you're going to have a May Day. I will, I'll guarantee it. The fire is, is different today than it was when we started our careers 40 years ago. <clears throat> you have a much more, you've mentioned it at the top of the show, the, the injury and death rate for firefighters is the same as it's always been since we joined, hell, before that, in the 70s. It hasn't changed. The number of structure fires has dropped by half. So what that tells you is structure fires are much more dangerous today, especially for firefighters than they've ever been. And the traditional tactics that we were taught 40 years ago are no longer effective. It becomes much more critical that we attack the fire aggressively with water sooner, as soon as we can. <clears throat> that's going to save the day. So that's really right. kind of Fast where water. we're at. Fast yeah, water, man. whether it's sprinklers. Well, sprinklers in the home or mm -hmm. using the deck gun to drop the first 500 gallons. That's yeah. it. Fast water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's where the fire department, we should act like it. We show up and we put water on the fire. That's right. what we do. Mm -hmm. Right. Josh, you want to add to that? I mean, I, I think he, he obviously covered it very well with all, with all the history of it, but you know, a, a, another piece of blue card is um, it continues to grow and we continue to get into some other areas of things that we respond to is so we, we have this hazmat ic certification that is based on the eight functions of command using the strategic decision making model when we respond to hazardous materials incident so it's not hazmatology for like the hazmat specialist it's it's the the company officer riding the front seat of that fire truck making good decisions on the front end to keep us out of trouble because we we see that number keep going up on 
um, things that some people will argue with you about and say that it's not a hazmat incident, but it is indeed a hazmat incident, uh, natural gas response. We continue to see that number in Don Abbott's Project Mayday go up where firefighters are being are calling Maydays because they're getting caught in, in a situation that they knew about, but they continue to do um, things that maybe they shouldn't do. So they, they get called to a natural gas leak. It's a no natural gas leak. They were told there was natural gas present. And they continue to try to be the problem solver there when every gas company in the country will tell us you know, the fire department needs to get there and evacuate and isolate and we will fix the problem. Right. And, and we get there because we're fixers. Right. I mean, that's why most people get into the fire department. They want to make a difference. And it's like, well, I can I can fix that furnace. I can help with this or that or shut this gas off or investigate inside or, you know, whatever it is. And, and we get caught up with it. So five, six years ago, we saw the need for that. So we developed this, the, the hazmat um, incident command certification, which is just a, a spinoff of um, the blue card command IC certification for structural firefighting. Right. I think one of the things that I, um, I really, I've really enjoyed and I, and I'm because so, so many people are afraid uh, of the uh, fire service politics but when i listen to the podcast you guys aren't afraid to uh criticize you know stupid stuff and i think that uh if we don't see what our where our problems are that we can improve on then we're we're just bound to continue to make those mistakes every time we respond on a similar call to that one. And we have to be able to, I guess it's me, I'm just pushing, learn that there are, you know, as Nick just said, you know, everything was different back in our day. I mean, we, when we went to fire, working fires, there were, re, it was real wood. I mean, real natural wood it may have been shellacked on it, but it was real wood burning. It wasn't these composites filled with benzene and benzene byproducts, et cetera, that we face today. It's for, new forms of plastic and stuff like that that's all changed and as nick said we could not we cannot fight fires today the same way he and i did when we started out you know steve it's that's one of the things with the program that we would hear early on when we first started blue doing blue card probably about 2008 people said well this is just the phoenix system and it was because we were all from phoenix right so i mean that's that's kind of the system you designed devised well it, and that was an accurate criticism of the system and we would say yeah it is it's a big metro city and we run 10 battalions and they have uh, safety officers assigned to the bcs and all these things Today, we started this in 2008. In 2022, it is not the Phoenix system anymore. This system has been revised by the thousands of fire departments that are using it now. And like you say, you have to stay ahead of this curve and keep your system up to date with the hazards you're facing. At the top of the show, you said 360s. In Phoenix, we didn't do a lot of 360s because we don't we're basically flat on grade city, mostly. We don't have a lot of mountains that we deal with, with one story in the front and two stories in the back. Right. Well, that was one of the first things we plugged into Blue Card, is we're in the Midwest, and they said, hey, pal, we got basements. I said, yeah, we had one house with a basement in Phoenix, and it burned down. We didn't worry about it. So we had to add basement content. Well, we've... <clears throat> Since then, is it like you said at the beginning also, is this thing is in the bottom of the world in Australia and the top of the world in the North Pole. So it covers everywhere. Well, all of those different building types get plugged into the system. And I think that's the beauty of the system is it's portable, is it's based off critical factors. So whatever critical factors that your fire department and your community deals with, you plug into that system. Josh mentioned the strategic decision-making model. Right. So, it works for me in uh, <clears throat> Las Vegas or in Worcester, Massachusetts, two entirely different cities, but they're using the same system and they're pretty much calling things the same thing. It's the other thing blue card does is it just co goes to the lowest common denominator, what we call stuff. So it, it becomes easier for the locals to customize the system to their day-to-day -day hazards they face. I think chief mentioned that uh, I think my, 
town, my city here, Coral Springs, Florida. I think I think I saw that they're on they're on it mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. lots yeah. of Florida. And and it's interesting because it was only several months ago and I listened to our you know, I have a station right down the street. Uh, I knew one of the previous chiefs when I first moved in here, we became friends. Uh, they were still volunteer department at that time, uh, both uh, just for fire. Uh, and then they we had county EMS, which this chief, this former chief, decided the city couldn't work that way. We had to bring bring in our own EMS and created our own paid EMS, then eventually transition the volunteer fight department to a career department we with an ISO of one now and you know it, it's a great department they they do great work um uh, very professional know their stuff but only a few months ago as i was listening to one call on a working fire oh, oh, on top sorry in the same week i believe we had they called two maydays which i can't even tell you the last time i even heard one from our our community and i was a bit concerned because i was listening for the follow up and um tried to switch channels to uh the uh the other the other ops channel um but i wasn't able to uh, to hear anything there but thank goodness as it turned out both firefighters were okay after the incidents were were done but the fact is that i was wondering what had changed so much in this community over the past just few years let alone the 30 years i'm living here but the past few years that that generated two Maydays in, in a week's time in a community where I, I can't believe I think I even heard one uh, before. Um, but again, today, what we're dispatched to is not always what we find when we get on the scene. And we need to be flexible enough in our abilities and our knowledge to know how to adapt and, adapt and overcome. And I think... Go ahead, Josh, go ahead. So one thing before we get too far away from it is we, we we talk a lot about accidental success. Like we shouldn't have to learn from our own experiences. We should learn from that too, but we should be able to learn from other people's experiences. And, right. you know, you mentioned about the Mayday workshop. So we've uh, we've put a couple thousand company officers and chief officers through that Mayday workshop now, and it continues to fill up, you know, about every single time we post a class and now we're doing them you know, all over the place regionally. And one of those things, one of the things with that class is we look at five different line of duty deaths that occurred between uh, 2008 and 2019. And, you know, the, the students give an, get an assignment prior to coming to class to review those reports. And, and one thing that's always alarming to me is we ask them before this class, how many of you regularly look at line of duty death reports and try to learn from it or even look at stuff from Project Mayday or learn from other people's experiences. And it's less than 10% of the people in a room raise their hand. And, and that's a whole problem in itself. I mean, it, a sports team doesn't play sports on Saturday and not watch film either Saturday night or Sunday to try to learn from their, from, from what, what did we do good? What did we not do so good? What do we got to do next time? How do we not do this again so that we have, you know, better outcomes and, you know, in our job, we should be able to learn from other people's experiences. And you talked about basements right here in Hamilton County um, in Colerine Township, Broxton and Shira die in a basement. And it wasn't too far away uh, as the crow flies in the city of Hamilton, you know, firefighter through the door, through the floor um, falls into the that. basement. Yeah. And, and really prior to that, um, before the Broxton and Shira incident in Miami Township, an Anderson Township firefighter uh, that was working part-time job, ends up dying in a basement fire. So just in this county, uh, four line of duty deaths from falling into the basement. And um, I, we're, we're finally getting there now in 2022, but it shouldn't have to happen at all, but it shouldn't definitely have to happen more than once. And right. I, I think in our industry, we take that approach of that would never happen to us. Those people are a bunch of idiots over there. They don't know what they're doing. We're different. And it's like, you're no different. It's, we're, we're really all the same and we can learn from other people's experiences. And, um, and I think that's part of this whole, the whole basement thing. Cause when you look over the last, we'll just say the last year in our country, there has been incident after incident, after incident of firefighters falling in the basements. And there's been several line of duty deaths yes. right. in the last 12 months where people fell into basements. And it's like this, this doesn't have to happen. We keep doing the same thing and expect different results. And it's like, it, 
it, it's just not going to happen. But um, <clears throat> we do. I think we do a pretty good job tra- generally training at the task level. But when it comes to the decision making piece, the biggest tool we have is our brain, and that whole decision making piece is is oftentimes. I think we don't give it the attention that it really deserves. Like what, when you, when you leave the front seat driving the fire truck and now you're riding in the front seat as a company officer, what do we do to really teach those people what to do? And if we're not doing anything with them, then they don't know what to do. So they go back to the, to what they know. And that is just operating at the task level and trying to make uh, the the skills they have fit. And without decision-making, we're going to see the same thing happen over and over and over again. You know, that's, Go ahead, Nick. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The other problem that uh, we face, that, that this issue, is there are a group of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, of fire service professionals, let me call them, that people listen to. And, and their view on this is you do not question uh, a firefighter line of duty death. It, it is is that, that people shouldn't be investigating that and, and our emotional state of us going out and risking our lives, it should not be questioned in any way. Well, it, it, those people are wrong. It, 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 the traditionalist, it, it, and what they want to do is they use the uh, the bones of the dead to beat the living with it. And, and it completely, you know, while they're memorializing the dead, what they're doing is they're pissing all over the living and saying, no, we're going to do this again and again. It, it's no. <laughs> So it becomes almost at odds with itself. Is this traditionalist versus change thing? It's the thing that was throughout when the old man had started the fire command thing. Well, you can't do this. You're changing the traditions of how we do firefighting. And he's like, yeah, somebody needs to. We can't. We got to quit killing ourselves over property that's going to the dump. It doesn't make any sense. We're not saving babies here it's in fact most of the time we're not today's structure fire kerber the fire scientist just gave an address somewhere where he said if your smoke detector's going off in your house there's a good possibility you're not going to make it out alive so you throw the fire department response time into that and today's fire problem if you don't have a plan of the the occupants of that building to get out if you're waiting for the fire department to save you, you're going to have a funeral. I mean, that's really yeah. just the reality of the fire problem in this country today. We have half as many as we used to, and the fatalities have remained constant for victims. It's about runs about four thousand a year. So, it, it, with half the fires, they're 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 more lethal. Right, and I think that uh, for those of us, whether we're still in or we're you know retired out or whatever the case is but it's been an important part of our lives when we see uh we read the trades and we look at the the news blasts online or through social media and every time we see a a loss of life we should be shaking our head in the no position why did why did this what were the circumstances that we lost another civilian or we lost a, a brother or sister firefighter we 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 can't afford to do that anymore. It doesn't work that way anymore. We and I think you made a good point. If you're not willing to see where we are today and what we have to do today for the fire service to keep both our citizens who we've sworn to protect and ourselves who, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't protect them. That it's just become kind of like an old fashioned notion, but it can't be. We have to take care of ourselves first so we can take care of the people that we've sworn to protect. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you said, we keep, we're like an old looped video that just keeps showing the same thing over and over and over again. And you read these articles online or in the trades and you're saying, wait a second, didn't that just happen? Didn't I just read this last month? About the, it's basically the same thing. It's like what well, another basement fire or something along that line, where um, it, we if we had just simply followed the path, then there's every good chance that that loss or that injury may not have happened. Now we can't prevent everything. We know that we're realistic about that, but there's a lot we can do better on, and that we need to do better on because. As 
science and technology speed ahead of us, we have all this catch-up time that we have to try to do. And it gets to the point where how much can we teach it in, in one gulp, basically, because so many things are changing. And again, I think that a lot of firefighters are a little too complacent. Well, I went through my our academy, and um, I, I was promoted to driver, so I must know my stuff pretty well. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty well set. I know my apparatus. I take care of it, yada, yada, yada. But until you get toned out at 2.30 in the morning, and, you're, you know, as soon as you pull out of the, the bay, you can see a loom up right ahead of you, or maybe even the flames. That's not going to – that's not necessarily going to work the old – the same old way. You know, we used to joke, we go off and teach this class and, and a blue card trainer is five days long. So it, it's uh, 40 hours to go through the trainer piece of it. So you can go back and certify your own members. And the, the audience for the class is typically uh, training officers, operations chiefs, battalion chiefs, safety officers. So they're, they're the, <clears throat> they're more the strategic audience. Right. So a, uh, uh, the first two days of the class, we're presenting, you know, this is blue card and, you know, this is why we do this. And and, and it was really more of a, a discussion that would turn into a debate. And so you would get all these reasons that they couldn't do these things. And most of them were were <clears throat> uh, not true. That, well, we can't because of regulation or standards or OSHA or this. And you're, no, this, this stuff all covers that. In fact, if you're not doing it, you're kind of violating some of it, I would think just on your own. And we used to joke about it. The point you were making is, well, we can't change it. And we, I used to tell them, you know, <clears throat> like the FAA has the NTSB investigate all the airplane accidents that happen. And there's no uh, volunteer. American Airlines doesn't have to volunteer for the NTBS, for them to show up to the scene of their airplane crash and investigate it. It's In fact, it, it starts more criminal in nature, where they show up and they say, no, we own this now and we're going to make some decisions. Well, that system has created the safest form of transportation in human history. And I would tell these group of officers, if the fire service was in charge of air travel, it would not be safe to be sitting in this building right now because it'd be raining airplanes. That is the approach that many of our traditionalists take in the world of change. So. Yeah, that's, um, we've seen it in many aspects of life, but and some of those it just doesn't have the same impact that it can have in the fire service. Well, just look at it in the beginning. Is NIOSH has to be invited by the department that kills the firefighter to come investigate that scene. And you, you think, well, and if they don't want them there, they don't show up. And you're like, no, you don't get a choice in this. Uh-uh. This is not something. See, because it was just accepted is we had these big funerals with all the bunting and everything else. So we would memorialize these tax these tactical accidents that we would have, and that's what they were. Nobody woke up in the morning and said, oh, I'm going to kill a firefighter today. They right. would have hauled you off to jail. But then you look at the aftermath and you think, no, man, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy we keep doing. You know, one of the things you, you brought up, and I think this is also a, a key topic, is that, you know, how often do we go back, probably more today, uh, with, to look at um, after action reports, uh, et cetera. But when I did get hurt, when I was up in the Syracuse area in Onondaga County, and um, I was put on, became a, uh, an inspector, but I also offered the chief, I said, you know, we could put in, I could spec out a video system for the department, which we could use a training. And since I can't fight fire, if the heavy rescue, which we, that's where we based, we put the video stuff there. That's where they wanted it. I said, if the rescue's there, and I'm showing up anyways, the follow-up inspector, I said, um, I'll shoot I'll shoot video on the scene of a, of a working call, and then we can review it afterwards. And the chief, who was a, a firefighter with Syracuse at the time, uh, he said, well, that's a great idea. No one's ever talked to us about that. I said, well, yeah, but I'm sure you do it in the city, right? He goes, no, no. <laughs> he says, you could do that? I said, yeah, yeah, we put the system on a trickle charger. We put it in the rescue. The rescue's plugged in in the bay. 
you take it to the, wherever the call is, I'll show up there and I'll break it out and I'll start shooting video and then we'll bring it back. And we did it. We In the following six months, we did it, I think, three times. We did it. And it, it, cha- it was a game changer for people to see. Uh, I did that? <laughs> well, <laughs> if they're on video, that's what mm-hmm. you did. Um, you know, you were right next to the building and you were walking around with your bunker gear on. I said, you have fire, fire on two floors already. Why, why would you do that? And, you know, every place I've been since, I've always said, if you want a video system, you know, and a lot of now a lot of companies are using them mm-hmm. and they have people who can't fight fire, but still are members of the department and they help them. They get trained or they've already they know how to use video stuff well um, and they do it today. But it's it's really such a simple thing. And the money today is way, way, way less than I I started with when I started my video business back in North Carolina. Um, I dropped before they were even uh, the uh, VHS cassettes had just come out for portable. And I got the first portable consumer, somewhat professional uh, portable recorder. And I had a cart with a camera and I started doing this kind of stuff and i just said this this opens a whole new world people could have their own cameras and they could shoot this kind of stuff and and i actually i wound up doing the first system for the, the department that i started out in, in north in outside of greensboro and uh unfortunately a year after i left it kind of may, went down to the um more entertainment attitude rather than uh, a learning tool but I, you can't. You can only leave the host of water. You can't make him drink, right? As, <laughs> as the saying goes. Um, you know what? I'm just looking at time. This would be a great time for us to take that break. When we come back, let's talk about um, the topic I want. To, other than the May days, want to talk about? Um, all right. I just forgot, folks. <laughs> we're going to come back to it. And that's with me at my old age. But we're going to take a break. If you're watching the video, you're not going to see anything different. If you're listening to the audio, you know what happens. We we play a little jingle. We get a few ads, commercials, and public service announcements in. And then we'll be right back with our guests, Nick Brunacini and Josh Blum, right after this from B-Shifter. Remember, tune in for that podcast, B-Shifter. Look for that on your favorite podcast platform. And we'll be right back right after these words. As always, please stay tuned. Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Five Alum Task Force. My guests today from Blue Card, B-Shifter Podcast, are Nick Brunacini and Josh Blum, uh, both with years of experience in the fire service and part of the Blue Card uh, system concept class uh, instructors, along with uh, Chief John Vance, who was supposed to be with us, but unfortunately wasn't able to uh, join us at the last moment. What we're going to talk about in this segment uh, is something that I've listened to on two of their podcasts, and I would urge every one of you to, if you listen to podcasts at all, tune into B-Shifter and look in their in their uh, schedule of, of podcasts they, where they're talking about radio traffic. We're going to talk about it now because when you listen to their, these, at least the last two podcasts they've done on radio traffic, you can if you listen to it and you're attentive to it, you will learn the difference between dabbing on the radio and what fire ground communications should sound like. So Josh, I'm going to take it with you because I really love when you play a clip that you don't like and um, you don't hold it back that you don't like it. And I think that's important because if we just said really nicely, you know, maybe you were talking a little bit too much on the radio. They're going to say, eh, screw them. I don't care what they say. But if you react the way you react on a couple of these calls, uh, podcasts that I've heard, I think someone's going to, their ears going to prick up. And they want to learn to see why what they did was not the best form of communication at that time. So if you will, please, Josh. Yeah. So communications is, is one of the eight functions of command and um, a, a missing piece in our system is we don't do very good training people on what we want them to say and what we don't want them to say. We give them an $8,000 radio 
and in some cases say, don't ever talk on this. If you're not a company officer, just leave it turned off, which is a, that's a whole nother piece. And then, you know, company officers have radios and, and sometimes, um, they just want to get on the radio because they think what they have to say is important. Um, so we, we really want a communications system where everybody's on the same page and everybody knows what, what is being said on the radio. And, and more importantly, these are the things that we, you know, don't say on the radio. So within the blue card system, we, we identify all of our communication. So the initial, some of the initial radio report stuff that, that is on the podcast that you've heard from, you know, Las Vegas, Coleraine Township, Ohio, Cobb County, Georgia. Um, I think it's, uh, I don't remember the fire department, but it's in uh, the, the, just outside the Phoenix metro area. Um, we, we've had a bunch of live audio pieces. Their initial radio reports are, are very orderly, and you, you really know what the next thing that they're going to say is because they use a system that is the blue card system of this is how an initial radio report sounds. And the communications part of it is just where we act out and we communicate that incident action plan over the radio. But how they're getting that standard approach is using really the strategic decision-making model. So they, they evaluate critical fire ground factors and they go through the strategic decision-making model process. And then they're just communicating that over the radio. It's not just I'm pulling up and I got to work and fire. Well, we, we got called to a fire, so we probably knew it was a fire. We're talking about some, you know, specific description pieces and within the system, when you hear an, an initial radio report, um, if you're if you're using this blue card system and, and you've trained on it if if i hear engine 17 on the scene everybody in route all the companies and everybody in the apparatus should, should shut up and be ready to hear an initial radio report because they're going to paint the picture of what's going on right now and they're going to communicate what actions they're going to take and then they're going to do a follow-up report which includes the 360 of what is really going on? Does it have a basement, not a basement? And I'm seeing all four sides of the building. So you're painting a good picture for everybody else that's inbound, which um, most of the time, second, third, fourth new company is going to a work and fire. That that helps you start to think about what might my assignment be when I get there. If it's, if it's you know, I got a work and fire on the second floor of a two-story house and they gave their initial radio report and communicated what they're going to do, I can kind of start to put in my own mind what what are the few things that the assignment may be coming from that first due mobile ic that's on that first due apparatus so um and and to get to that point you have to have an incident command system that has staging because if you don't that means everybody's going to pull up and really do what they want to do um and if you want one incident action plan one incident commander that's the only way you get to it. Otherwise, what you have is if there's seven companies on the first alarm and there's no staging, what you have is seven different incident action plans because everybody wants to do what they want to do. Right. And especially if there's mutual aid coming in and you're able to communicate, we're going to take that as a leap of faith, I guess, because we know that that doesn't always happen. But if you're going to have them come in, you, it's the same thing. You don't want them who are coming in from out of your area to start talking all over the radio, other than whoever their, their lead officer is going to be, should be checking in with the IC of on the scene. And he, that should be the only person who would communicate on the radio with the IC or the IC's designee for incoming mutual aid to talk with, and not as opposed to getting on the same fire ground channel and and taking that up with well we're about uh a mile and a half away we'll we're on our way we're, we'll be there soon we just can't have that yeah and, and that doesn't matter and, and somewhere along the line our industry got wrapped around that because we hear that all over the country that uh, an apparatus we're in route with this many people or we're in route and we're on the fire ground channel and the traffic that really matters is is when you're there so you know engine seven's level one okay well now you're there and i can use you as a resource and assign you a task to do on the fire ground, which lets everybody be, you know, on, uh, under a single incident action plan. Um, what, what that whole in route thing is doing on the TAC channel is tying up radio time when I have companies operating in the IDLH environment. And the really only people I need to communicate with and that need to have the priority is the people in the IDLH. 
and the incident commander will tell those other people when they're when there's an assignment that needs to be assigned to them. Otherwise, you know, it's it's radio silence. Once the first company marks on location, gives their initial radio report, and then that mobile IC will assign people based off of the single incident action plan and, and the critical factors that they have identified. Right, right. You know, there's a um, there's a t- television show. I'm not going to name its name. It's a, it's a fire show. And I remember back uh, when it, it premiered, I was out of town. I was up in Wisconsin uh, doing some work up there. And uh, I recorded it, and I came home to watch. I was excited. Uh, we, My former company, we had worked for 20 years to get a quality uh, uh, reality fire show on on the air. Um, and that didn't happen. And then since 2014, we've had a uh, a... Uh, uh, we wrote a pilot script for a show based on the Philadelphia Fire Department. Uh, we had met with their film and TV office. They loved the idea of the script. Uh, the then commissioner liked it. But anyway, on this TV show, the premiere, uh, it opens up with a working house fire. The special effects were excellent because they did show the smoke puffing. So for those of us who knew what in and out smoke th- means, you know, you we already know we got to be careful here. Uh, the latter company pulls up in front. The battalion chief comes up, parks his buggy about three miles away, um, uh, gets out of his car, reaches and grabs the mic and says, uh, this is battalion. Uh, I'm on scene. Uh, I got uh, some fire on the uh, first and second floor. Uh, we'll, we'll, bring, we'll bring you more later. So then you have the stick going up to a second floor window with a rookie on the end with a pike pole. And the, the latter guy says, all right, I'll tell you, don't don't hit that window until I tell you to. He says, I'm saying, hit the window. Wait a second, that smoke is puffing. You're not going to hit that window. And he goes, okay, now. And the kid does it. Of course, what do you get? You get a flashback, backdraft, blows the kid off, kills the rookie, injures the, the other guy. Come, They come back to the fight. You don't hear anything else. You don't hear any more from the IC. That's the thing. Comes back to the barn. And that firefighter who got hurt, uh, his girlfriend comes off the rescue and he says, you got it? She goes, yeah. She gives him a vial. He goes into the closet, shoots up. That's in the first 12 minutes. I shut it off, deleted it, and I was done with it. But that's still on TV. That show is still on TV today. Yet I don't know if a single firefighter who, who likes watch who watches that show. Um but the fact is that we've learned too much. We have other people who are firefighters who think that's the way to do it. You just, you can't, you, we don't have time or room or the safety to uh, color between the lines in this well, job. When you look at like just the history of communications, it, it, we get radios and we're using radios. Is is people would recognize okay when when exciting stuff happens on the fire ground whatever it is is the radio traffic picks up because everybody's reporting on it. Well, <clears throat> nobody ever sat down and said, "Here's the critical communications that helps to drive and manage the incident action plan." So this is what we're going to focus on, and this other nebulous radio chatter is uh, we shouldn't be doing. Because what that system did is, is people started saying, well, there's not enough room on the tactical channel. So now we have to have another channel, the command channel or the automatic aid channel. So you would have three different channels to manage the same IDLH hazard zone. And you may only have six, seven, eight companies there, and you're operating on three different channels. Well, you have fractured the entire incident operation. If you can't do it on one channel and you start to look at some of the after action reports where stuff went wrong and that is always in there is the communications were completely upside down. Well, it's because we don't use radio discipline and and stick to the stuff we should be talking about is the radio almost becomes a vent for us where we get to offload our stress and then it's competitive. So if some engine gives a great report, well, I need them to know what I'm doing too at this point. 
So, it, it, or we invent something new, like accountability, PARs. When we started doing personnel accountability reports, well, you had a PAR going across the, the whole front end of a structure fire where three quarters of the communications was just accountability related. And you're like, no, this is too much. This is upset. And see, the people called us because the building's on fire. They want us to put the fire out. They don't want us to show up and do all these fancy strategic things. That, that's invisible to them. Those strategic things should support us putting the fire out. If they don't, we shouldn't be doing them. So a lot of that stuff, you mentioned Abbott. When we started doing simulations at the Phoenix Command Training Center a million years ago, we, it, Abbott would tape record them, right? And then he would analyze all the radio traffic. When we first started this, he said 50% of all radio transmissions are nebulous garbage that just fill up time. So that was the thing we started cooking out of it and saying, no, we, we, we don't say this, we don't say this, this is where you start to talk. And that became the initial radio report and then CAN reports from operating companies to get back the information the IC needs. So it's a routine. It's almost like you have to develop your own tactical language <laughs> at the scene of these IDLH hazard zones. And it, 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 that really becomes the key is once you standardize that, it shortens and those communications mean a lot more. And, and Josh mentioned it in his thing. Is, and this is what sells people on the program. Because we'll be sitting there, there'll be an IC and they'll be doing their thing. They'll assign the first th two companies, let's say. And they're getting ready to assign the third, and you ask the group, where are they going to put them? And 95% success rate. He's going to put them on the Charlie side on the second floor. And the next assignment, yeah, yeah, engine five, go to the Charlie side, second floor. So what it does is it paints a picture that we all can connect to at that point. Right. Josh, yeah. I know you have to run. I want to ask you one quick question. Since you go around teaching this oftentimes, when you talk about this radio traffic and, and how much is nebulous and not unnecessary, do you ever get blowback from uh, the people taking the class on that? It always starts out with, you know, people blow back or, you know, they, they have some kind of a reason why they should say something. And, you know, that's usually, I mean, if you're in a five day class by the end of the second day, they, they've recreated it and made it their own and they're buying into it. And like, especially in trainer classes, because um, everybody in there is going to be an instructor and we require them to do teach back and then they're evaluating each other. Right. And like we use priority traffic as, as a red flag, you know, piece, you're, you can't complete your assignment or you need help completing your assignment and priority traffic means something to everybody. And we use status change if you're changing location or you finished an assignment and you're ready to come out and, and get a new bottle or recycle or, or whatever that is. And, you know, oftentimes that starts out like we wouldn't say that we're not going to say that. And then by the second day, they're like, uh, yeah, that makes perfect sense because that actually means something to us. And um, you're, you're not face to face. It's like talking on the telephone. So uh, if you're, if you're going to be a gentleman and you're sitting at the table, you let somebody else finish their, their statement before you, you know, jump in Well, on the radio, that, that's really hard to do. So we, we use the whole, you know, priority traffic status change piece and can reporting as well as the order model. And, and we let that loop close on the communications and, you know, really everybody figures it out on their own. So, I mean, we, we were, we were recently at a fire department that said, we're not going to use priority traffic. We use urgent. And it was funny because the next day they come back and I, and I told them, I said, Hey, if you're going to use urgent, everybody knows what that means. That's fine. Yet then use urgent. And the next day, half the class comes back and they're like, yeah, we we have to quit using urgent because urgent has just become a word that everybody says when they want to get on the radio and say something. It really means it means nothing. It's it's just that word like, oh, the, he said urgent. So that that's the permission. That's the super secret password just to get on the radio. But half the stuff they were saying wasn't urgent. Right. So, you know, they 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 made they're, they're making that transition, you know, of hey, we're going to start using this priority traffic thing instead of urgent. It just makes sense. Right. All right. Great. I'm, I want to hear that, but I'm glad to hear that after the initial you know, the first day, around the second day, they'll they'll buy into what you're trying to teach. Josh, I know you got to run. Thank you so much for taking time for a very busy schedule. I'm glad I caught you at home. And uh, I really thank thank you for it. And I want to get you back on again uh, in sometime in the next few months, something like that. All right. Hope you'll join us. Great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Stay safe and stay well, brother. Josh, we'll Nick, see you soon. 
Nick, you're going to be able to stay with me a little bit? I can't. Uh, Good. I got nowhere Good. to be. All I'm right. where I need to be right now. Yeah, yeah well, I, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be right now, uh, <laughs> both according to my wife and my doctor. So we're doing okay. <laughs> Good. Um, so so with the, with the radio traffic, how do we, how do you suggest, so when you train the trainer, I can understand that you can get maybe by the second day, you can get that buy-in. And I'm glad to hear that because I think anybody who is going to be a trainer is more open or is a trainer is more open to the, the, the real crux, the, the various cruxes of the matter, uh, so to speak. But what, do you, what kind of blowback do you get from when they try to take that home or that you've heard when you've had firefight, you're doing a fire department you know, with the members there uh, and you're teaching, you know, good radio etiquette. Is there, do you get blowback there in those meetings or those classes? When we first started doing this and Josh mentioned it is, is you would get there in the beginning and, and you know, you introduce yourself and the group introduces themselves and, and they know what they're there for is, okay, this is a new operational system we're going to use to manage incidents. And, and they're worried that it's going to displace them tactically. Is It's going to change what they do operationally. In the beginning, I said, this is a, an Uber safety system where you won't, don't let firefighters risk anything. You thought, no, that's not what it is. In fact, when I retired, it, before I left, I was worried because we were becoming too good offensively. Mm. Where you would put a fire out uh, using the offensive strategy and the after action you're doing, if you shake the building real hard, it'll fall over. Right. And you think, no, man, this is, we, we, we shouldn't, we're getting too good at this. <laughs> it, it, it's going to get us at some point. So, I really, my experience with the system is it causes us to become more effective as firefighters. And universally, that's what firefighters want, I think, is they want to be more effective. So they'll defend what they do, but they'll put it, they'll put their guard down enough where they, they'll engage what you're doing because you're there. And so what happens is if you can dis engage them in a discussion where you use simulations and say, okay, here's a set of conditions we're talking about. Well, you, then they, they start to buy in because they see that, oh, no, this isn't what you're talking about, is us not taking risk. You're talking about just a different way of managing something. So, and, and that's part of what Josh had mentioned, is we go from a system where everybody's got their own incident action plan at the scene, where we're all going to just work in under one. Well, I think most firefighters see the advantage of having one versus eight. And then, especially the more experience you have, and, and that's who we're starting to pick up now. Fire departments you never thought you would have because of just the, 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 the amount of fires they get. Well, and they, they start to say no, because we're, we're having too many negative consequences from some of these experiences. So they start doing blue card and they see that it makes them more effective. So they, they, so the operational leadership of the department will be looking for a solution and they'll think, oh, we'll look at it. And once they do, they start to figure out, oh, this, no, this lets us do what we want to do tactically by eliminating a bunch of stuff we, that we've been trying to fix forever anyway. So uh, I think that's the reason the system's still going. We started this talking about Alan Brunacini a million years ago. Well, those were the issues he was dealing with in the 60s. And so I know this is the best way to fix this. Well, it's taken, that's how far ahead he was of the rest of us, I guess, because now this is becoming the standardized thing. Even with NIMS, it is really when and you would look at it is the states of Florida, Texas and California are the most experienced at large incident operations due to the amount of natural disasters they get, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where that NIMS system is the strongest. Florida, Texas, and now California is starting to fall under this. Those are the states where most blue card departments are coming from now. So, <clears throat> all of that is starting to line up. 
So the NIMS people are starting to say, hey, this blue card thing is real. And so like in California, like they'll do structural protection in wildland. That, that's its own different branch or division or wherever they put that in the thing. And you'll have experienced IC saying, okay, for the structural, do we have blue card departments here? Because we know it's, it, it's a known quantity of what we're going to get. Is we can listen to the radio and know exactly what's happening at the scene. See, that's why the leadership likes it. When we first started doing this, the fire chiefs of these these smaller, uh, sometimes uh, but half of our customers are volunteers. So it kind of follows the same thing. The chief of those departments before Blue Card, they would listen to the radio and they'd have no idea what was going on at the scene of a fire. A, a month into Blue Card, they said, I don't leave now. Is it, I'm listening at home and I know what's going on at the fire ground. And if it sounds like it's out and by the time I get there, they're loading hose, I'm not going to go. And he said, so, or I know it's a serious call right in the beginning with the initial radio report and I need to get there sooner than later. So, and I think the operational experience is what does it. Now, and we tell people you got to customize this for your own deployment capability. So mm -hmm. however many firefighters you get to the seat and the hazards you face. So it looks a little bit different everywhere, but the terminology is the same and the organizational piece is the same. So, we, and really the system was designed here in, in essentially Maricopa County where Phoenix is the big city and we work with 25 other cities. So the system was designed to connect those fire departments. And then FEMA started doing grants for blue card here, probably, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Oh, and they said, if it leads to interoperability between individual departments, we're for it. If uh, you can complete the program in a year, we will fund it. And if the department can take it over, well, the biggest financial piece of it is the very beginning. Well, if you get a grant for that, the federal government will typically pay for the whole thing then. And then to maintain it cost about 10% of what the initial thing was a year. So really, Steve, is Blue Card is designed just like the paramedic program that our fire department used or the EMT program is you needed to maintain a certification because if you didn't have that certification, you couldn't write on a fire truck. Right. So if I, if I lost, I, I, as an officer, I worked on a ladder truck. If I lost my EMT certification, I couldn't ride on that truck anymore. It doesn't make sense to me that a battalion chief who their basic job is to take command of fires needs zero hours or qualifications to do that. I was a ladder captain. I needed an EMT certificate to take a blood pressure. That does not jibe in my mind. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we just created a structural firefighting management thing that looked just like all the other search we went through. So if you look at uh, EMS, hazmat, tech rescue, if you install car seats for your fire department, you are a certified car seat installer. You have to have continuing education to continue that. Again, it don't make sense to me that a battalion chief can manage a fire where there's 16 firefighters inside a building that's getting ready to collapse around them, and you need zero hours of training to do it. It, it just, it's like a pilot not being trained to be a pilot. I, I, you can't, you can't justify that. Right. It makes no sense. And, and it's, and unfortunately, and sadly, because this is my, my bread and butter, is we see this very common in, in the in the volunteer fire service yeah. and and you know i'm not even talking about the numbers and, and how difficult it is today but the fact is it's still the same that we we a lot of times officers are elected and it's a uh, it's a favorite show mm -hmm. that's what it is it's you know this I, this guy goes drinking with us and all the time, and uh, we, he's a great guy, and he's funny as hell. So I'm going to vote him for uh, 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 chief of you know car two. I'm going to vote him in car three. Uh, you know, I, I was always amazed that when I was in North Carolina, my chief uh, sent my 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 buddy and I and one of the our day guy day uh, day caretakers. They worked 24 and 48 off, and they were paid, but the rest of us were volunteers, and. Um, sent us to a state fire college, the North Carolina State Fire College. So I got, first year I went, we had no idea why he picked us, but 
because I said, I'm brand new. Why don't you send people who've been here who have been in the department longer than me? He goes, no, I want you to go. So basic firemanship, then hydraulics, uh, and then um, high level rescue, which for an ag- agrophobic guy like I was, uh, I was not looking forward to that class. But by the end of the week, I was coming off a six story roof, uh, <laughs> rappelling down with a, with a, a Stokes, without a Stokes, I was doing it. So when I got to this other department, and I, I came in with, and I brought my certificates with me. Goes okay, that's good. You know, I couldn't get couldn't get elected to be dog catcher. You know, <laughs> couldn't be elected to dog catcher. I did get elected to be uh, on the the board because I helped bring in. I did their first fundraiser. They never really run a major fundraiser, and the first time I I wanted to do it, and they said it's never going to work in this community. We're too small, so like that. Got seventeen thousand dollars first year, just with direct mail campaign. That's all it was. Uh, and then the next year, I was already gone. But my buddy who ran it that year, they made over thirty thousand that year. So um, you know what happens is you get people who always think they know more than you do, and um, yet you know you're making eighty uh, percent of the calls, eighty five percent of the calls. They're making thirty percent of the calls, but they're all drinking buddies at the local tavern. Mm-hmm. So that's what it yeah. turns into. So well, it's, a, it's a social organization more than anything. Exactly. They spend more time together socially than they do professionally. I mean, it's just, that's the way some of those organizations work. Exactly. Exactly. And the fact of the matter is one of the things we've stressed on this podcast over the years is that I don't care if you're a career firefighter or a volunteer firefighter or part pay volunteer firefighter, you are, you need to be a professional in your either vocation or avocation. And if you're not willing, want to bring yourself to that standard, then you need to find a place to go. You know who really doesn't care? The fire don't give a shit what right. you are. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's, you're, you know what you are to the fire? Fuel. Fuel. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That That's what's about. And so, again, it all comes down to education. And I think that the blue card, uh, as when I first learned about it, the chief was first on, and I've been paying more and more attention to it and listening to the podcast. I think the blue card offers any fight department, you know, and, and I'm sure that you guys work with a fight department and it's, if it's a small department with finances and stuff like that, uh, because you guys are there to deliver educational processes, not just to sit back, uh, sit back and, and get, and get rich and be throwing all these dolls, dolls over your head saying, Oh, the- you know, Steve, what's happened with the program is, is first of all, it, it, it became, uh, it changed the landscape when FEMA started granting it. So they mm-hmm. said, no, this is a real thing. We, we, we've been looking at it a long time. But one of the things that we've done with the program is there's uh, an organization called ACE, which is the American Council of Education. And what they're responsible for is assigning scholastic upper division adult education scholastic credits to occupational training. Mm. So you get equivalency credits. So as an example, if you go through the blue card trainer program, that is good for five credit hours at a three to 400 level. So there are people, chiefs go into school to get a master's degree that graduated a year early or a semester early because they were blue card trainers and it covered five of their electives. Josh mentioned the hazmat modules that we have for a blue card first responder. That will give you, I don't know how many credits it is, one and a half credits for chemistry for that degree. So, So now blue card has become part of the pantheon of adult education. So it, like you said, it's truly a school is you get upper division college credits for going through blue card if you want. In fact, it's as easy on our website. You click the ACE button and it takes you to the local ACE place where you can process all that. So it, it, it's again, the work that Alan Brutusini started it, it, it left us is, is now become its own educational track, which is good. For, I think for the fire service, it, it professionalizes what we do. Exactly. Exactly. And again, same thing. No matter what position you are in the, in the fire service, um, our communities are expecting us to be professionals on every call. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, whether well, we're at the football game or we're taking down, fighting a big box fire, big box store fire, they want us to be professionals. Exactly. And that will get tested in the legal system. That's where a lot of our work ends up, is it'll end up in court because when we respond, something failed. I mean, that's what we'd respond to or some kind of failure or accident. So when we get there, or what we do becomes part of that record. So, and in fact, Blue Card has been very helpful with that. I mean, people say, part of the process that we will get involved in is we'll say promotionals. How do we process this Blue Card with promotionals? I said, well, if you're certified to be an IC, why would you even test for it then? You train them and that's the skill they have. Well, you know, we've always had a tactical portion. I said, well, just ask two or three risk management questions in an oral interview. That's your tactical. It, it, is how are you going to supervise and manage your crew as an officer now? You, you know what you're going to do tactically because you did it in blue card. You got certified in it. So a fire department will not stop doing EMS training. They can't. If they right. do, they can't perform EMS anymore. So I, I think you're going to see the same thing. I don't know if it's going to happen next week, but it's going to happen eventually. It may happen after I die. But pretty soon, firefighting will be its own thing, it, it, its, its own course of study. And, and it's not going to be a mystery like it is today. It, right. it's, it, it's going to be more like the EMS side of our work, I think, which yeah. will be good for us. Young people glum on to Blue Card because it's the way we educate. What we Blue Card became... The second edition of Fire Command, there was too much content. An instructor couldn't show it all during two semesters. So what we did is we took it and we tore it apart and then did it online. So basically, you're getting two semesters of class online, and then it's interrupted by the certification piece, which is good. So it, it kind of keeps it building on itself that way. See, that's great. It, I think that today, with everything changing so fast, uh, in our lives, and uh, what we what our jobs are as firefighters, uh, and we run everything from you know your dad's favorite Mrs. Smith with her cat up the tree mm -hmm. to which is still as valid today as the first day he uttered those words because it's true, it's absolutely mm -hmm. true. We you know it's like when I was managing a, a medical office, I had. A, teach a couple of my employees that, well, they didn't like the way the, the patients were talking to them on the phone. I said, they're sick. You think you're, <laughs> yeah. you're always in a happy-go-lucky uh, <laughs> mood when you're on the phone, when you're sick as a dog? They're sick. They don't feel well. They're looking for test results. They're worried about they were I said, you, got, you, have to, you have to be the better person, be understanding and compassionate and empathetic with these people. And the same thing, I think we're seeing, beginning to see, and maybe it is thanks to Blue Card, is that we're seeing uh, a maybe a growth spurt in those in the uh, in the service who really want to be the best that they can be and want to help shape their fire service. Um, and I think Blue Card. Is and it's it's nice, yes, in the trades to see all these universities advertising these programs, and I think that's great because I think we need we do need firefighters to get four year degrees and stuff like that and, and come in. But I think the fact is that if we can get their heads on straight through concepts in blue card that you guys promote through the program, I think that's going to change the individuals which then will will demand the change in the department at the, lead to the I shouldn't say demand lead to a change in the department as well as more and more of the the you know the officers the the line officers and the command officers get involved and they see it and I'll tell you the truth by this time considering you know how long blue card's been out there and maybe as you said it's because they're finally getting you're getting the recognition through FEMA uh, I think you, hopefully you're going to see more and more. Um, I mean, Josh says he's still you know, going all over the country with these things. You have the two, you have two big, uh, more coming up, two big uh, classes coming up at the uh, at the center in, in Phoenix over the next, uh, before the end of the year. Um, I, I'm telling you folks, if you're listening to this, you at least, at, at the very least, go to bshifter.com, go to the website, see what's there, learn about Blue Card, uh, and 
try to go in with an open mind and see what it could do for you and your department. Because if it can bring you up a level in your in the professionalism of your department, and maybe you can't do it all at one time. You have to start, you know, in, start with one little piece first, and then another piece. You add it on. If that will bring more professionalism to your depart, department, which means you're going to be servicing your community and its citizens in in a better fashion, then you have nothing to lose by going by going to it. Well, at the end of the day, it makes us more effective. So in the example I use is uh, you, it, before Blue Card, we'd send six companies to a fire. After Blue Card, we send the same six, and we only use three or four of them. And the incident's over 30% faster. It, 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 the, the damage is less all the way around. Right. So it, it just it keeps checking that box. It, it, it's, if it's effective, it's it, that's why we're still here. Is people use it and they say, "Oh, it is." In fact, it gives us a better use of our resources. So we can we have enough to get the job done, basically. And then it, it, it's a system that allows me to fix problems. I used this system when I was a response chief, and that is the way I would manage the battalions or the ships I worked in. Is around the work. And what that did is that increased morale, is it brought us all a little closer together uh, as far as the ranks went, is uh, we started training like this, and companies that wanted nothing to do with their BC were inviting the person to have lunch with them again. And, and so if we make it around the work, the more we can do that and the less about us individually, the better we are organizationally. So Exactly. That's what yeah. it boils down to. It's a hug and a kiss, man. Yeah. That's exactly mm -hmm. what it is. Nick, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that you have a busy schedule as well. And um, I just think that there's so much value to Blue Card uh, that I don't, I don't, th I, I'd like to see it. I don't know if there's a way. I mean, <laughs> I just want to see it more and more. We're yeah, heading that way. It's, I yeah. think you're going to get your wish. That's our our, our goal and objective. Yeah. We're going yeah. to continue doing this. You know, it, the other part we didn't talk much about it, but if you go to B the, to the website, it's uh, it, we have a magazine that we put out, the B Shifter magazine, right. and there's an issue there that's just devoted to this building we operate in now. It's a very unique place. So all the stuff that my dad collected throughout his career is in this building, including his fire truck. So oh it, wow. And this is one of the things where people come into it and it just, it, it kind of discombobulates it for a little while because it looks like a fire station and a school and an office, but it's, it, it, it's all those things at once. So it, 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 it's very unique and it's going to continue more so that way as we keep uh, finishing the building, if you will. Yeah, that that's wonderful. I, I had the pleasure of being out in the uh, Phoenix area uh, back in the, Late eighties, uh, I we had, I was chairman, co-chairman of a, a, a convention, a national convention for the organization of the synagogue administrators I worked for, and we they uh, we had a beautiful place there in, in in Phoenix, and then they took us I know, to a, a cowboy town where they do cookouts and stuff like that. So they took us, it, it was just <laughs> but they took us around the city, and it was it was beautiful. It's a place I've always wanted to go back to. And much more so after I was in the fire service, because I want to see the building. You know, I want, that's yeah, one thing I, it's on my bucket uh, list. Well, you know? yeah, when you're out here, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll give yeah. you the tour. Right. It, it, it's good fun. All right, great. Listen, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I've heard so much about you uh, over the years and more so once I started tuning into to, to the concept of Blue Card and Blue, B Shifter. And as a former firefighter, to to you and to your family and the heritage that you guys have brought to the American Fire Service, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, the dedication uh, and that it just, it just, you're just keeping your dad's work alive uh, for those who only heard the name and never knew the, knew the man or got to meet him or read him. Uh, it's not too late, folks. You can read the Chief Brunacini's books, anytime you want. Uh, they're available anywhere you want on all the fla favorite f flavors today. 
Exactly. And, um, I will. I can guarantee you that you will learn. I mean, I used to just read the articles in, in Firehouse every month, and I couldn't believe how much I was learning from the articles that I – and I had a great depar- volunteer department there, and training was wonderful, terrific. But I still learned stuff, even simple stuff, from the Chiefs articles back in the days that, that I was learning in my, in my departments. So to actually have had the honor and privilege of, of meeting him – once in person at a conference and then uh, having him on the podcast early on in our, in the first year that we were on the air uh, and now to, to work, to work with you and have you on. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I want to bring the, the, the I was going to say the three stooges back, but I want to bring the three of you guys together. Again. Oh, no, but they, you, okay. you hit it right on the well, head. That is who we are. Okay. Yeah, that's, I'm the middle of three boys. And that's my late father. Always should call it's us bad. the three stooges. In fact, Steve, we're more like the Marx Brothers than the Three Stooges. In fact, <laughs> and you know what? And look what they accomplished. Right? Oh, exactly. Yeah, uh-huh. look at yeah. that, what both groups as well. So you know what? That's okay. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's who, good. We're B shifters, man. That's exactly. It. We will live by it. All right. Um, thank well, you again for having me. Mm-hmm. And, and I look forward to uh, to having you having uh, three of you on the show. Um, I'm going to start listening even more carefully to some more topics we can address and maybe, you know, God willing, uh, we can get chief Abbott to join us. Um, that'd be wonderful Absolutely. because, you know, yeah. there is mm-hmm. there. I mean, if there is and folks, I'm going to tell you something, especially if you're an officer, if you don't check both B shifter and chief Don Abbott's, um, the website is project mayday, project mayday.com. Right. Oh, .org. I think it's projectmedia.org. Okay. Mm-hmm. You need to. You need to go and read what Do- Chief Abbott has. Listen to some of those audios. They are chilling, but they are full of educational steps to help you have a safer and better department to the best of our abilities. Again, we know this is a dangerous job. Nobody is denying that. B shifters are not talking about that. We have a job to do. Sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's like pulling teeth from the hippopotamus. But the fact is, we still took that oath because we felt the calling inside. Nobody just becomes a firefighter for no reason. I think it's a calling that we get to help other people. And this is people are doctors, people are nurses. We're firefighters. That's what we chose to do, and to help people. So we're the lucky ones. <laughs> we, you know what? We damn well are. Yes, we are, no, man. Best gig going. <laughs> it is, Love by it. far. All right, yeah. my friend. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. And folks, if you're watching the video, that will be the end of the video. If you listen to the audio, you know what's going to happen. We come back with one more s- short segment at the end. So thanks for tuning in, folks. We'll be back next week with a new uh, a new guest. And we look forward to sharing that person's wisdom with you as well. So as always, stay safe and stay well. And we'll see you next time around. Take care, everybody.